Hi everyone, Zach here, and welcome to the prep video for lesson 11 in this series on developing a survival game. This video and this series have been brought to you by Patreon sponsors. That said, let's make a start. In this video, we'll be working on our inventory actor, meaning we'll create our inventory proper. We'll set the size of our inventory, and we'll set it so we can add non-stackable items to our inventory. This will work by either adding a single non-stackable item or multiple non-stackable items to multiple slots. So we have a few things we need to discuss to be able to do this. And that is we need to talk about local variables. And in order to talk about local variables, we need to talk about scope. And we need to talk about recursion. So let's start with scope so we can get into local variables. Scope, simply put, is the visibility of a variable and visibility in this case means how long is that variable valid for so there are a few ways to think about this and we'll go into depth on it as we move through these slides variables are loaded into memory just remember that the names that we see on screen say inventory size or character health or character hunger are just easy ways for us to access that address in memory that said, once a variable is no longer in memory, no longer in the stack, it is no longer valid. If you are new to programming, you're new to C++, Unreal, what have you, and you don't get what I mean by stack, just think about it. If it's no longer in memory, it's no longer valid. If you are curious about the mechanics, the stack in programming, I do recommend, especially for C++, looking at I'm going to say this guy's name wrong. His name is Frank Metropolisus. I can't say his name. He has a C++ tutorial series on the Learning Programming Academy. Unfortunately, it isn't free, so there is that. But I will put the name of his series on the description for this video. So that said, when we think about scope, this applies to all variables. When a variable is no longer in memory, it ceases to exist. Now, scope comes in two main flavors. There's some nuance to this, but we typically talk about scope as global or local. And so far, we have been using variables that are akin to global. They aren't really truly global in scope, but every variable we've used so far kind of be considered global for our purposes. That said, if you're struggling understanding this, that's fine. I'm gonna put a few examples up. Think about scope for those with a psych or bio background as the lack of object permanence. Once it's out of sight, it's gone. Or if you have a child or have babysat a child or have younger siblings and you play peekaboo, when you cover your face, you cease to exist. That's why they get that startled happy response when you lower your hands. So when you cover your face, you're out of scope. You no longer exist. And yes, I did just explain object permanence. Another way of thinking about this is like the saying, out of sight, out of mind. In this case, out of sight no longer exists. So why do we care about this? Why does this matter? Well, as I said, we'll be using local variables. The scope of a local variable is different than the variables we have used so far. So far, the variables we've used exist as long as the object in the game exists. So as long as the camera exists, the variables for the camera have continued to exist. As long as the player exists, the variables related to the player exist. When we have an enemy, if we kill the enemy in a game, the variables in that particular instance of that enemy cease to exist because that enemy is removed from the world. It might not be, but I'm thinking older games where you kill something and it just vanishes from the screen. Once these things, these objects, cease to exist in the game, they are removed from memory. In fact, if you use a destroy operator, the destroy node, in Unreal, you can see when it's still in memory and when it leaves memory by looking at the list of actors. Now, local variables, well, they only exist within the function where they are used. And in Unreal, at least in Blueprint, you can only declare a local variable inside of a function. So when we do this, that means every time we recall, sorry, every time we call the function, the variable is reset to whatever the default value is. So for example, let's say we have a function that wants to find the index or location 
of an empty inventory slot. In this function, we store the index as a local variable of type integer that we have named index local. By the way, you should always identify your local variables in some way. I include the word local. I know people include uh, just an L at the start or end or an underscore L. However you want to identify it as a local variable, that's fine. Now, the first time we call this function to find that slot, our default value for index local is zero. It goes through slot zero, it's not free, slot one it's not free, two it's not free, and then it goes to slot three and see that three is in fact a free empty slot. It passes out the value of three and we leave the function. At this point, index local ceases to exist. It's no longer in memory. We then add another item to our inventory. So we call this function a second time. Our index local is zero again and not three because it's being declared and initialized in that function. So when we call the function again, it goes back to its base state. Give you a hint why this is an example. This is what we're doing today with our find empty slot function. Next, we have to talk about recursion. And the thing about recursion that you need to understand is you won't understand recursion until you understand recursion. Is you won't understand recursion until you understand recursion. Is you won't understand recursion until you understand recursion. Aren't you glad, oh sorry, aren't you glad I didn't say banana? Yeah, I actually did all of those takes, by the way. That wasn't a re-record. By the way, that joke, the orange you glad I didn't say banana, if you get that joke, if you know that joke for the knock knock joke, that is actually an example of recursion. You know, knock knock, who's there? Banana, knock, banana who? Knock knock, who's there? Banana, banana who? Keeps repeating until they finally get annoyed and you say, orange you glad I didn't say banana. Interestingly enough, I, I included that caveat. You keep going until they get annoyed. I'm going to use that as an example down the road again. All right, so, Let's, let's be serious for a moment. What is recursion? Well, first, there are two terms that you need to be aware of. The first term is recursive function. This is a function that calls itself. We'll be using recursive functions in this series. The next term you need to be aware of is recursion itself. So recursion is the process in which a function calls itself or the technique of a function calling itself. Now, that is slightly misleading because that actually is a definition of direct recursion. So recursion comes in two types. There is direct, what we'll be doing today, and that is the process of a function calling itself directly. There is also indirect recursion, and we may do this in section four. The joys of redoing the series means I can potentially update some things I did previously. Indirect recursion is when a function calls another function, and that function that it calls, calls the first function. So A calls B, B calls A. Thus we have recursion, but through an indirect route. And, and there's some other forms of indirect recursion that can happen, which is actually what we'll see in section four. But simply put, think of it like, say, infinity mirrors. The reflection is recursive. That might make you go, well, doesn't that lead to infinite loops? Yeah. It can, but that that's not on the function's fault. That's not on the concept of recursion. That is on bad design. So usually, and I will say that with indirect recursion, when you don't realize it's happening, that's when you tend to hit infinite loops. When I prototype things for this series, I had infinite loops sometimes and I often found they were due to indirect recursion, particularly with our, our item system that we've worked on already. So don't worry, I've already, we, you won't see those bugs. If you follow along with the tutorial, I've set it up so we never actually get those infinite loop bugs, but just be aware, deviation and changing some of the things we do can lead to that recursion and that inappropriate recursion. But in good recursion, in an intentional recursion, there is an exit or a base condition that will break the recursion. So I'm going to use an example of recursion that's often given in computer science classes. And it's a mathematical concept of the factorial, which is represented by N exclama exclamation mark. So if you don't remember what a factorial is, a factorial is the product of all non-negative integers less than or equal to N. So 
If you're sitting there going, what the heck, Zach? What are you talking about? Give me a moment, and I'll walk you through this. So let's say we want to do five factorial. N is equal to five. We are going to get every value less than five and multiply them together. So five times four times three times two times one. If we were to think about this mathematically in a recursive method, it'd be five factorial is equal to five times five minus one, times five minus two, times five minus three, times five minus four, which would result in five times four, times three, times two, times one, which would give us the answer of 120. So what's the base state in code for this? Well, if we were to write a recursive function, there would be a check and that check would be if n minus one or minus whatever equaled, oh, sorry, was greater than one. If it isn't greater than one, actually it'd be greater than or equal to one. If it isn't greater than or equal to one, then that's when you break out of the recursive function. Because otherwise you're going to get five minus five, which is zero times everything, which is zero. So we have a state, a condition that we look for five minus whatever. Is that greater or equal to one? If not, if we do not meet this condition, end this recursive function. So Factorials are recursive. We can think of it like factorial, that's the name of our function, n, that's the argument we're passing in, is equal to n times the function n minus one as the argument. So to break this down, factorial n on the left-hand side is the first time we call the function. The function then calls itself on the right-hand side. The n minus one is just the update to the argument. You can actually have math operators in your arguments. Within this function, there would also be that check of is n minus one greater than or equal to one. So this is the sort of base concept of recursion. It's a function calling itself over and over again to a certain extent, to a certain point. And we're staring at math, which is never fun, is it? You're probably going, well, cool, we can do math. Why should we care? Well, I have it in this video for a reason, right? And before I get into that, a lot of game design is math. AI, navigation, the ASR algorithm used in other ways, it's math. We use recursive mathematical functions all the time. But, but I get your point. So I'm gonna give two examples of recursion in game mechanics, and then I'm going to give a, um, entire publisher's example of recursion and is a game mechanic itself, or sorry, a gameplay mechanic. So behind the scenes recursion, what we're doing in this tutorial video, we'll use recursion to pick up and add multiple non-stackable items to our inventory. Our function for adding a item to our inventory is recursive. We'll also use this for stackable items too. So we pick up multiple non-stackable items. It will add one item go, do I have more to add? Yes, call myself, take one away from what I was originally trying to add in and add one from that and keep repeating until that is zero or until I hit my other base condition and fail out. The idea that in section four that we might do in direct recursion, we will have a spawning system that will attempt multiple times and that is the base condition. So either until it finds a valid location or it hits a particular number of attempts to spawn a resource. So this is indirect recursion because we actually aren't calling the function directly. We're gonna call other things that call it up. What we're doing here is we are going, all right, if I found the location, I'm happy. I hit my base state. If I haven't, I'm gonna do this 11 times. I meant to do it 10, but it ended up being 11. And if I don't find one by the 11th, I'm done. Move on to the next item on the list. Now, in terms of gameplay, recursion comes up a lot. The Tower of Hanoi puzzle comes up. It's in Mass Effect 1. You see it on at least two different missions. In fact, I was gonna give you an entire list of the Tower of Hanoi as a recursive game element, and every single game that kept coming up was a Bioware game. Every Bioware game pretty much has a Tower of Hanoi puzzle in it. And that is a recursive puzzle. They have so many, they've even mocked this in Dragon Age Origins. While recursion might be hard to understand when we think about it as math, we see it a lot. The Tower of Hanoi puzzle, 
We see it in chess and checkers. We see it in inventory systems all the time. We see it in spawning systems all the time. Recursion is nothing to be afraid of. It is a bit tricky to sometimes understand, sure, because you have to remember what state you're in. You have to think in a bit of an abstract way, but it isn't, it, it, it might be difficult at first. You might struggle with it at first, but it isn't hard. It just takes time. Give yourself time with this material. That said, we've covered everything we need to for this prep video. I look forward to seeing you in the main tutorial video. And if you want to be here when we continue to work on our inventory system, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button down below. Sorry, the subscribe and notify bell. Hit the like button so you I know that you enjoy the material I am giving you. Even if I did a really bad recursive uh, joke in this entire in the middle of this video. All of that said, this series has been brought to you by Patreon sponsors like Haynes, Quadmenson, and Rian. And once again, I look forward to seeing you in the main tutorial and hope that you have a wonderful day.